Hello everyone. Welcome to the course overview of Art History 2. That would be Renaissance through the Modern Era. In this slide lecture we're going to take a look at the beginning of our course of study and follow it right on through to today. But before we do that, let's take a peek into an art studio from the 1800s. Now this etching by an unknown artist is sort of a caricature as we see all these activities going on at once in a very small studio space. However, it's not really that far from the way that artist workshops worked, especially in the Renaissance, when the gathering together of artists and workshops really was uh, fertile ground for the development and innovation in the arts. Now let's look at a slightly different artist studio. Here we have a figure drawing class from the Philadelphia Academy of Arts, somewhere in the 1800s. Now if you look closely, these women um, in the figure drawing class are drawing a cow. It was deemed that women couldn't quite handle drawing a figure, a nude figure, as the men did, so it seemed like a good idea to have them draw a cow instead. Uh, this class was overseen by a very famous artist named Thomas Aikens. Well, when we consider these women drawing and sculpting a cow in order to learn how to draw the human figure, then we can just realize that we have come a long way since that time. There are so many styles of art to cover that we're going to flip through these artists pretty quickly and maybe your head will be spinning by the end but perhaps also you can have a real understanding of the great revolutions in art in the past 500 years. We'll begin with the artist Masaccio who started painting in the early years of the 15th century just after the turn of the year 1400. Now at this time art seemed to just jump forward in a revolution with a return to the naturalism that we saw with the Greeks. In fact, the name Renaissance means a return to classical learning, a return to the um, great wisdom and approach of the Greeks. Well, with Masaccio, he was actually a very prolific painter. And when he, with his images, we see a real return to this naturalism when the figures have uh, more believable gestures and they seem more human in their expression. Unfortunately, Masaccio died at the age of 28 and even though he had lived a very short life, he left behind a strong body of work. We can only imagine what he would have done had he lived a long life. An artist who did live a long life was Jan Van Eyck. This artist, among other things, is credited with being the first to really make use of oil paints rather than egg temper that had been used earlier. Now, uh, Van Eyck painted with glazes with multiple layers of thin color, one on top of another, to achieve this deep and rich effect. So here we have Fra Filippo Lippi, and the image on the left is presented to demonstrate that as we get into the early Renaissance, um, the figures are taking on more emotional content. They're beginning to express in a real human way. And on the right, we have a very famous Madonna and Child which is a favorite theme of the Renaissance. One thing I love about this image on the right is the little bit of mischief in the eyes of the angel that's holding up the Christ child. So next we'll take a look at the artist Botticelli, which is one of my many favorites. The image on the left is from his painting Primavera. Now this one was done in egg tempera, unlike the richer hues that we see with oil paints. And you can see it's a softer look. This woman in this painting is one that he painted over and over again throughout his life. She was a young noblewoman and she died at a young age, but in his memory he kept her vision alive and Botticelli painted her as almost all of his female figures as you'll see. Now I just love the image on the right because it's of a little kind of a cupid nymph uh, rascal crawling out of the armor that's typically worn by Mars. This is from Botticelli's painting, Venus and Mars, and the arm above is of Mars who lies uh, asleep after a tryst with Venus. 
and that mischievous little Cupid figure who's probably made it all happen is now playing in the armor as Mars sleeps. So that's just an interesting touch, I think. Now let's look at some very familiar names. Here we have Leonardo da Vinci, who was a brilliant man in addition to being a wonderful artist. His mind was so quick that he actually really had trouble finishing things, so in his life he didn't really have a great reputation. I'd like you to notice the figure upper left and the woman on the right. They're both profiles. But see what different characteristics we get because the artist has just changed a few of the ways that he's rendered these forms. The heavy brow on the left versus the soft brow on the right, and on and on. And then we have another famous figure of the Renaissance, and that would be Michelangelo. Michelangelo's temperament was such that he was really a sort of a loner and a little bit moody but he was one of the great artists of all time. The image upper right is of something called the Pietà, and the story behind this sculpture found in the Vatican is really extraordinary, but you'll have to stay tuned to hear the full story. The other two images are from the Sistine Chapel, which he painted overhead under much duress over a period of about four years. Uh, contrary to a popular myth, he did not necessarily lay on his back to paint it, but rather reached up overhead. Now, if you think about the pain of this, um, he must have had sore shoulders at the end of the day, especially at the end of the four years. Uh, now we're going to move on to another favorite. Okay, true confession, they're all favorites in their own way. This is the artist Albrecht Dürer. And what he did, he was German, and he was the first to make wide use of art prints. And by doing so, he was able to bring art to the masses, to the middle class people, and also to make quite a bit of money for himself. This is a self-portrait of the artist on the left. So you can see he was quite a handsome man also. Uh, the rabbit on the right is another revolutionary work of art, even though it's just a little bunny, because it's a very early watercolor. Uh, Durer was one of the first artists to use watercolor for art and one of the first artists to make wide use of art prints. And he also had a very unique and quite refined style. So now let's go from this just into the weird for a minute, okay? We'll talk about Harmonious Bosch. If any of you have heard of surrealism, which is basically weird art from the unconscious, to define it simply, well, Bosch would have been uh, really uh, active in the early days of Surrealism, even though he's probably about 400 years, 500 years before the popularity of Surrealism. Um, his work is just weird, and a lot of it has to do with heaven and hell, temptation versus, um, you know, inspiration, and like that. And some of it is rather uh, risque. I had to be careful in choosing what I wanted to focus on for the stills here. During the Renaissance, his work was collected sort of um, in the back room, so to speak. So patrons would collect his work, and then they would display it in ways that people needed to be invited in to take a look at it. So his life actually remains rather mysterious, but his work is truly extraordinary and laid the groundwork for modern art. So another real groundbreaking artist who lived a turbulent life would be Caravaggio. This is an interesting painting that really shows what he was known for, which was uh, overly graphic, dramatic art. In his day, not everyone loved it, but this is called uh, Doubting Thomas. So after the death of Christ, Thomas meets Christ and doesn't believe that he is real. So Christ grabs his hand and puts it into a wound. Uh, Masaccio has cho I mean, excuse me, Caravaggio has chosen to do this in a way that is quite dramatic. So Caravaggio lived a troubled life, and he may well have had to deal with uh, uh, lead poisoning. Um, he was probably an alcoholic. He was rather violent. But this passion, this very same passion, came forth to leave us with beautiful paintings. There were some people that followed in his footsteps, and one of the, his prime, they call them Caravaggists, 
So his name was Caravaggio. Those that followed were Caravaggist. The artist Artemisia Genileschi, pictured on the left, was one of those who took that dramatic style of Caravaggio and made very many beautiful pieces of her own. She was the first woman in the Florence Art Guild. Another uh, very well-known woman painter of the day was Judith Leister, and she was Dutch. Here we have her pictured on the right in a painting that really looks like her, her teacher, which was the artist Franz Hals. Now what would a walk through art be without a look at a Rembrandt? Rembrandt is known for his strong contrasts of light and dark, and this is a lesser known of his works, but shown here to, so that you can all see the real mastery. Another thing that we see here is looser strokes. In other words, we can actually see the paint strokes of the artist on the canvas here, and this was rather revolutionary for its time. Now let's move on into the days just before the French Revolution. Louis the Fourteenth. When you stop and think about it, someone at some point in history had to invent high heels. Well, it was this fella to show off his awesome legs. Louis XIV happens to be the longest reigning monarch of all time, and here he's at the age of 63. And he did uh, have this portrait set up, supposedly, in order to show his lovely legs. One of the things about Louis XIV is that he was prone to indulgence, as was his court. And this meant that the art of the time reflected this indulgence. And also, um, art had to be controlled, because throughout time, art, political art, has affected public opinion. And thus, when artists, when um, leaders are in kind of precarious positions or are worried about losing power, they tend to control the arts. Here's a typical Louis XIV sanctioned painting by Fragonard. Oh look, we have the swing, and here we have a young lady being pushed on the swing while her secret lover reaches to her from the bushes below. This was painted for one of the mistresses of Louis XIV, who did reject it. But here you see the kind of, uh, if you were looking for emotional depth, you would probably look somewhere else. And this depiction of the sort of light-hearted intrigue of the court is a direct contrast to the lives of really most of the people in France at the time. This is a painting by one of the Linane brothers, who often worked together on their paintings. And here we see depicted the noble dignity and suffering of a typical peasant family in France of the time. Now this was uh, the majority of the people, and this great contradiction between the wealthy and the poor, and the taxing of the poor and the middle class, is what led to the French Revolution, which really helped to revolutionize art. Now let's pop over to this new place called the United States. Here we have John Singleton Copley. And on the right is a simple portrait of a soldier. Uh, one of the things we see in the depictions of Americans rather than, I mean those in North America, rather than the depictions in Europe, is that the, the new settlers in the Americas wanted to depict themselves as more hardworking. So you'll often see them, a woman might have her needlework at hand or sitting with a bowl of fruit like that. And on the left, I just find this extraordinary because this man uh, was probably enslaved at the time of this portrait. And yet, how can we not see the human dignity in this face? So while these images are from the evolution of the colonies, into the United States of America, there was another revolution that happened shortly after, which was the French Revolution. And during the French Revolution, um, the people rose up against the aristocracy, and it was actually a pretty brutal uh, revolution. Um, on the left, we have one of the main painters that was working with those the revolutionaries. His name was David. The gentleman in the picture had a skin condition and so would often do his correspondence in the bath. One day while he was bathing he was stabbed to death by a woman from a rival political faction. Now on the right we have a painting by the artist Angelica Kaufman who was one of the women working in the era and what she did 
was she focused on these moralistic paintings as there was an ideal of the time. This is the same ideal that drove our, uh, the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And that was an ideal of a perfect humanity that we actually, it was called the Enlightenment, but by Enlightenment they meant a society that was free of the typical ills that tend to plague societies. So this, and that, and that we could actually live, you know, free of murder, free of suffering, free of poverty, and all just kind of get along. Now, you know, it works in lesser or greater degrees, but let's move on. As people explored the Enlightenment, they also had to come face to face with our natural human tendency uh, that's maybe less enlightened or just more well-rounded as humans, so to speak. You know, this is the same thing that Plato struggled with, actually. Here we have the innocent girl with this demon sitting on her chest and this horse figure that is um, peeking in and about to somehow take advantage of her. Uh, these same images were on the walls of the offices of Sigmund Freud, maybe a hundred years later, a little bit over a hundred years later, as he uh, founded psychiatry and delved into the realm of the unconscious. Well, let's go from the unconscious to the wider view of landscape. Oh, here we have Aurora Borealis, a painting by Frederick Edwin Church. Church was one of the master large-scale uh, landscape painters that was working in the Americas during this time. Here's another one. The artist Albert Bierstadt was uh, working in the American West during the 1800s. There was a group of artists that traveled. There were artists with Lewis and Clark and that, that traveled on their own and they would make studies on site in watercolor or to make sketches and then go back and make these massive paintings in their studios and this was how the public was educated about the West. So let's look at what led up to the revolution in art with the Impressionist period and this is the artist Gustave Courbet. His art began to move away from the hyper-realism that we had seen in the period before called Romantic Era and Neoclassical Era. So with Courbet, he moves away from these depictions, these idealized depictions, and here showing people breaking stones. It's actually called the Stone Breakers. And with this painting, we see that the shapes are sort of simplified. He doesn't show every wrinkle in the clothing, but he shows instead the strong gesture and nobility of these people. Um, this particular painting was destroyed by the Nazis in World War II, so we only have it in memory. But it is seen as one of the primary paintings that began to move away from the neoclassical or very uh, realistic academic style into the art of the Impressionists. Now I'm going to take a moment and talk about art as political vehicle. The artist Daumier he spent his artistic life showing the common people and making these sort of mm, slightly cynical, um, poignant statements. I just love this one because some people talk now on subways about manspreading. And here we have these two women that are, uh, shall we say, a little irritated from the men that are taking up a little more room than might be prudent. So as we go into the Impressionist period, I'd like to step aside and talk about one of my favorite artists, and that is the artist John Singer Sargent. He was a master of using unlikely colors together to create an effect, as you see here. One of the things that happened in the 1800s was the advent of photography. We could approach photography from a variety of angles, but I'd like to begin by sharing the photographs of Julia Margaret Cameron. She was a woman working in the early days of photography, and she was able to capture a real human feeling of the people of the mid-1800s, and I could just stare at her work forever because we look at these people long gone, and in these images we can see that they're not so different than us. Another important photographer was the photographer Lewis Hines, and what he did was travel throughout the country and take 
pictures of children that were working, very young children in many cases, as we see here. And these photographs were presented to Congress in the early 1900s and they resulted in child labor laws. So this is the power of art to change minds and to change laws. Now let's pop into the Impressionist period. The art on the left, the little Piper guy, is painted by Manet, who's considered the grandfather of um, Impressionism. What happened with Impressionism, as I feel, is that art got more and more and more realistic. And at a certain point, there was nowhere to go except to dissolve the realism and look at something else. So from realism into Impressionism, where artists sought to capture the impression of a place. This little Piper guy was uh, presented at the yearly big art show called the Salon, and it was scandalous. People hated it. But what he was doing was intentionally moving away from great detail and instead seeking to capture a simple portrait, an essence. The two images on the right are by an artist with almost the same name, Monet. So Manet on the left, he came earlier, Monet on the right. And Monet is probably one of the most famous of the Impressionist painters. Here we can see how he played with light and color to great effect. After the Impressionists, we have the Post-Impressionists. And this is very interesting because they were kind of rebelling against the Impressionists who had become quite um, firm in their ways of painting. And so they were kicked out, so to speak. And then they started their own rebellious group of painters. So the Impressionists rebelled against the academic painters. And the Post-Impressionists rebelled against the Impressionists. And on and on. And next we'll have the father of modern art, considered by many, and that is Paul Cezanne. This artist came along um, in the late 1800s and he began to paint in very simple patches of color. He played with perspective. He didn't focus so much on realism. And in, the, in his day, uh, his art was not really very well appreciated, but it is very much appreciated today. And taking what he's done and going even further was the Fabis. This is by Andre Durain, who was the leader of the Fabis, and they were simply wild beasts with color. So they took all of the rules of color and they kind of just tossed them out the window uh, and made up their own rules of color. And this was one of the paintings that resulted. As we look at the development of modern art, it's important to remember that there were big wars going on, much conflict and poverty in Europe at this time. So as is uh, likely to happen, young people growing up in times of conflict tend to rebel. And that's exactly what happened as modern art was in a lot of ways a rebellion against the stiff standards of what we call the academic time. So let's step to the side and look at Art Nouveau. This was another uh, style that came out of the late 1800s and early 1900s. And here we have a very idealized and patterned version of reality. This image depicts the four seasons by one of the leaders in this field, Edvard Munch. And one of the things that Mush did was he made his images available copyright free. So we see a lot of these images still in use to this day. And now, of course, surrealism. So surrealism really kind of came out of this um, rebellion of the earlier 20th century as artists began to move and move further away from what is considered uh, reality. What is reality anyway? The top three are on this page are by a favorite artist of mine, Rene Magritte, who was a master at irony and um, kind of odd plays on imagery as we see here. And below is one of the most famous surrealist paintings by the artist Salvador Dali. Now we're going to move even further away from realism to the Cubists. Many people think, what in the world? What, what is this? Well, let's look at what it really is. Do you see the guitar player on the left? 
what the cubists sought to do was to take reality and scramble it up. It's as if you're looking at a vase from five directions at once, above and below and beside and like that. So what they were really doing is just playing with the way that we view the world. Now, you know, Pablo Picasso, who did this image on the left, uh, was a master at realistic painting by the time he was 15. So it's almost like he had nowhere to go except away from realism. And that's exactly what he did. Okay, so here we have a couple of famous modern painters from the early 20th century. And the modernist movement was based on Zen, was based on a rebellion against the status quo. It's as if artists suddenly realized that they could do anything, and so they did. The one on the left is by Wassily Kandinsky and is a classic example of a sort of intellectual abstract painting. And the two on the right are by a female artist named Georgia O'Keeffe. And she was a part of the modern art movement, but she really made her own way. The one on the bottom of the waterfall is from a canyon near her home in New Mexico. And I simply love it because it is both abstract but quite realistic at the same time. There was a rebellion. You know, isn't art always about a status quo and then a rebellion and then a rebellion against that rebellion? Well, here we have it. This is called regionalism. There was a whole group of artists that saw what was happening with modern art and were like, well, wait a minute. That's not how I view art. And one of them was the art artist Thomas Hart Benton. You might recognize this as the Lower Buffalo River, which is exactly what it is. He was an artist out of Kansas City who uh, was very widely known, but he loved the Buffalo River. So he would come down and paint, and when it came time to dam the buffalo, uh, I think that was in the early 70s, he testified before Congress as the sort of celebrity defendant and was uh, single-handedly very responsible for the Buffalo River not being dammed. Oh, and now let's go to Mexico. Here are two surrealist painters also of the same era. Uh, we have Diego Rivera, whose paintings are all of these three. And then we have his wife, who's actually better known, Frida Kahlo. And they were both um, rebelling against the uh, Mexican government. That was their form of rebellion, as they were communists. And they really believed in communism. And Diego Rivera did large-scale murals throughout Mexico City. And I think he even has some in this country. So, uh, and now, another important artist which is taking art into a real physical level. This is Jackson Pollock and his art called Action Painting. Now, um, I just had a student in my painting class recently do a paint pour where she mixed painting and just poured it on a canvas. And in some ways it was another version of this. He was really the first one who did this uh, and became widely known for it. And what he says is that when you see his paintings, you're seeing the result of his spontaneous moment being at one with the canvas. In a way, he's dancing with the canvas and the paint. Having seen some of his most powerful works uh, in person, I'm actually really impressed with this artist and his work. The opposite side of that would be this hyperrealism. And one example, this is um, Chicago by Richard Estes. And what he did was he worked to make these um, paintings that were hyper-realistic, that almost looked like a photograph. Now, one of the things that makes them possible is the power of the photograph. An artist couldn't paint this without a photograph to use as reference. And yet, the fact that he's doing this, making a painting to look like a photograph, is really noteworthy in its own right. So now, in conclusion, we come to modern times. And in our modern era, with art all around us, with the really relatively recent use of the internet as a way to disperse images, so we have so many images at our fingertips. I can just type in an artist's name and I'll see everything that he's done. It's really like these fishes eating their koi. These are fish that live to be 150 years old. And here they are captured in a watercolor probably fighting for which morsel they're going to eat.
And here we have a ship that dissolves into a bridge in another kind of a play on our eyes, an optical art painting. Or the woman with the birds flying around her head, which is really what I can feel like after I've looked at so many images. But when we get back down to the very basics at the root of all of this, it's that innate desire within all human beings that um, urges us to create in some way or another, whether that be through a garden, a painting, raising a child, or simply uh, bringing a little beauty to the world around us. And it is that which we celebrate and explore through this long history and the study of that history. Thanks for listening.